Welcome to a new year and a new season of Savvy Talk. I'm joined by Amar Samra. He's such an amazing person, both as an entrepreneur. Last year, he released a documentary about his journey in an effort to raise awareness for the plight of refugees who actually have to cross dangerous waters all the time to survive. I was in Egypt and had a great conversation with him and hope you guys enjoy it. Please reach out to me and Amar and let us know what you think. I'm so happy to see you. Same here. I'm so like, welcome to my home. Have you been here before? No, I haven't. It's okay. really nice. Uh, it's sort of like the old school like uh, compounds, right? Yes. And it's like uh, in, in the States, this is like your backyard, but here they call it your garden. Okay. Yeah. So it's like, it's like, uh, come to my garden. It sounds so British, so much fancier. Um, first, before we start, we need to tell every, all the listeners, first of all, how, how we know each other. And I want you to introduce yourself. Well, how we know each other is, uh, I'm trying to think now. I know, is how it, do we know each other? In Dubai? Something. Is, We've known Marwa each other for a very so, long time. Yeah. Yeah. I knew Marwa. Yeah. That's how I met you. We're talking at least like 10 years. Or more, more than that, back. more than that. You've been doing some incredible things. Can you tell everybody who you are and what you do? Well, I'm an entrepreneur. So I run uh, a collection of small businesses, I guess. Um, they're mostly in the tourism um, environment and education space and I guess I've most people know me as an adventurer having been the first Egyptian to climb Mount Everest I ski to both poles and climb the seven summits and various um, you know adventures in cold places and <laughs> um, and I recently had a, a movie come out a documentary mm-hmm. about a journey that I did about three, four years ago, or attempted to do, I should say, where we, me and my buddy Amr tried to row across the Atlantic Ocean. So, um, so yeah. yeah. I want to hear about that. But let's, before we start, I want to go a little bit about your background and your story. So you were an investment banker. You were living in London. You had a very corporate life mm-hmm. working in the finance industry. And one day you woke up and you're like, I'm done doing that. Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, Six months into starting working as an investment banker in, in London, the sort of the, the veil came off, you know, and I, you know, the, the, the initial excitement and momentum of just, you know, getting your first sort of job, getting out of the shackles of sort of being under the patronage of your family and all this kind of mm-hmm. stuff was all very exciting. Once that started to wear off a bit, um, I quickly realized I didn't want to spend the rest of my life behind a desk doing this type of work. Um, but I didn't have the means to, to leave right away. But I, a plan formed, I started to form six months into it because okay. I had started to, I got fascinated with um, adventure and uh, traveling. How did you get fascinated with adventure and traveling? There was a guy who worked with me. His okay. name was Dennis O'Connor. And it uh, sounds like, like now it's, it sounds a bit like Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he, he, he was the most adventurous guy I knew at the time. And we used to go, to, go for lunch together every week. And um, one time he told me about this amazing trip that he'd done where he cycled from Nice to Naples mm-hmm. and opened up a whole map. And he had all these scribbles and notes and all these things. And it was so exciting. And it was the first time since I'd graduated um, or even from school days that I had a feeling like this is what I want to do with my life and it made no sense because this was just a way of spending money and time but it wasn't you know it wasn't income was not a job yeah I mean how are you going to pay the bills before the days of sort of you know you could you could make a career out of you know traveling through being an influencer on Instagram or something like that so I couldn't rationalize it but I but I couldn't you know deny the pull pull that, that this had and so I started putting a plan together okay so if I wanted to backpack and now I started to believe that I needed to be gone for a year, you know, not, not just go on a short trip. What does it take? How, how much money do I need? And I started to put a budget together and then it became, that became the goal. And I did a calculation, realized it's going to take me just under two years to save that money. And all of a sudden, you know, work wasn't as hard anymore you know, because I was working towards that goal. goal. So, you know, so I was you know, happy to be learning whatever skills I needed to learn, hoping that they would serve me sometime in the future. And um, but I I have to tell you, like, even when I got the money and I was on the way to HR to kind of know that you're leaving like this, it was a it was nerve wracking. Um, But I remember walking out of the building, having, you know, done the deed. And I just felt so light. 
You were so happy. Yeah, I was so happy and I felt that, you know, the, there was just so much, you know, out there in the future that is unknown. But I realized that I have a, you know, a affinity and affection to the unknown. Like when, when life becomes so predictable for me and I know exactly what I'm going to be doing in two, three, five years, I start to really like get, get really uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, so that was really, really an exciting time. And uh, that was kind of the start for me in terms of like big adventure. And you, so you saved up for two years so that you can take a year off and go backpacking. How did you know like what to pack, what to bring, where to go? Because you've never done this before. Yeah, I did a, I did a bunch of research. I, I spoke to a whole bunch of people that had done it before. And I learned, you know, a lot from mistakes. I, I mean, I had to pack for a trip that ended up being 370 days, all in one little backpack. And I was going from Siberia to the tropics, back again to the southernmost point of South America. So I had to carry from literally like... Winter to summer? Yeah. But you just like, you'd never been hiking before and then all of a sudden you decided to take a year journey where you go from Siberia to... During the, when, <laughs> I, when I decided that I was gonna, I was gonna leave in like two years, yeah. um, I had still my holiday entitlement. So I, then okay. I started, I started this tradition where I would, at the very beginning of the year, I would go to my boss and say, here's my holiday for all of the year. Okay. And as soon as I'd get it approved, I would book all the holidays so, okay. that, so that they couldn't sort of... Mess it. They have to pay me back to, you know, yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in the UK, it's, you know, holidays are religious, right? Yeah. So, so I would, you know, I would, I, I, um, by the time I left, I already had built a bunch of experience, but it wasn't anywhere near enough to prepare me for what I was going to experience. And what was your first mountain? My first attempt to climb like other than hiking, my first big hikes were in the Himalayas, but um, my first big climb was in Peru in the Andes. Okay. And um, I actually never made it uh, to the top. And I remember feeling like, you know, I, I had al I got altitude sickness at five, six thousand meters. And I was like, you know, my dream was to climb Mount Everest since I was 16. And I was like, is this the end for me? And I, there wasn't a, there wasn't a, an ecosystem. There wasn't people that I could go and talk to mentors or people that had done it before especially yeah. in egypt or in the middle east in general yeah and, and online wasn't really as accessible and intuitive as it is now so i couldn't necessarily just reach out to an international climber and be like hey can you help me or can you give me some tips or yeah so i was just figuring things out as i as i went and um but then i eventually did you know you know when i went to bolivia i then did end up summiting my first mountain you know sort of dispelling this you know, idea that I wasn't cut out for the high altitudes and and then it kind of went from there. I started climbing progressively harder mountains. And uh, even when I came back from that trip and got a job again, because I had to, because I spent all my money on this backpacking trip. What did you do when you came back to work? I got a job back in the in the same bank. You did? Yeah. Um, I don't know how they, they would have Took me you back? Again. But they, you see, this is the thing, the crazy thing is that they took me back as an associate and the people who had continued throughout that year that I was traveling, I also were associates. So when I came back, I was like, I struck gold because I went on this one year trip. You took a hiatus and came back and you didn't lose any footing yeah. in your career. Yeah, yeah. And how do you choose what your next adventure or where you're gonna go? Or how do you choose the mountain or the... I think it chooses me in a way in the sense of like these ideas, I've never known where they come from, but these ideas just come out of nowhere. Like the idea of like rowing across the Atlantic came to me while I was on a plane sitting by the window seat watching a movie and I just happened to look to my right and just saw this vast blue didn't think anything about it watched the movie movie ended I looked back same vast ocean and then just out of nowhere this idea came like you know how amazing would it be if you could cross that ocean without the use of a sail or a motor if you could just row it you know just human powered and uh, I started to I, I, I start to always romanticize these goals initially you know how amazing would it be to take on the, you know, the ocean and just be one with the, with, with the elements and everything. I started doing, but then the problem is that this idea then starts snagging. And then if it's sort of days and weeks and the idea is not going away. Then you lean into it and go I, for it. I realize, yeah, the only way to get it out of my head is to actually try and do it, right? But it's, it's insane. Yeah, it does. It, it was, it's crazy. Well, it always starts as being insane. I had me and Omar combined. We had 30 minutes of rowing experience in a 30 machine. 30 minutes in the gym. on like a rower in the gym. On a concept two. And, and a concept two. And you decided to row, a, tell everyone like what you decided to do. Well, we decided to row unsupported um, across the Atlantic Ocean from the Canary Islands to Antigua in the Caribbean. 
but obviously to get to the start line, we knew that we had our work cut out for us. So we spent a year and a half, uh, just over a year and a half, you know, training our bodies, getting all kinds of education, spending, um, you know, tens and tens and tens of hours at sea, in the North Sea, um, you know, in, in the Canaries, just to prep for that journey. And when we started, because it was a race, when we started it, it was, um, I think we were, you know, some of the most prepared uh, team. But like, what about the elements? What, what were your fears? We all, yeah, I mean, when you, when you do adventure, you have to, it's kind of like life. So you, you have to embrace that 99% of everything that's going to happen um, will be outside of your control. But the, 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 the trick is to master that 1%, you know, and that 1% is all the things that you can do and have control over. So whether that's like, you know, um, how hard you're going to row, the kind of conversations you're going to have on the boat and the kind of what if scenarios you're going to play beforehand to make sure that you're ready for as many scenarios as possible. It's being able to break down and build up the boat um, as second nature. So if anything breaks down, you become so... So you have to involved. like know how to repair the boat? Yeah. I mean, within reason, obviously, like, you, yeah. know, you, there, you know, you have to be prepared for, you have to, like, it's not just enough to have a plan A, B and C. You're going to have to have until plan J or something. Well, how many hours did it take you? A thousand kilometers uh, from shore. And then on the ninth day, we, our boat ended up uh, capsizing, which is not abnormal for an adventure like this. But the boat is designed to self-right itself, but it didn't. And the life raft didn't open which is akin to a skydiver losing both his parachutes. Oh uh, my so God. It's, it's certain death. Um, and we spent the next 12, 13 hours sort of, you know, between treading water to battling the elements, trying to manually inflate the raft, you know, and then finally dealing with a full-blown rescue when it got dark, pitch black, and things started to really, like, uh, compound. So it, it became, like, really... Uh, it's really like uh, it became at the end it was sort of a miracle that we uh, that we managed to co to come out of it alive. I, I didn't see the documentary, which I'm going to see. The name of the documentary is Beyond the Raging Sea. Beyond the Raging Sea. And did you think you were going to die? Yes, there were um, the first when the boat capsized didn't self right. It wasn't. It looked clearly like it wasn't going to self right itself, and we tried to inflate the raft, and the la the raft wouldn't inflate. That was probably the first time I realized, you know. You know, we could die here. Um, and then it went from thinking we might die in the next few hours or a few days if, you know, if no one finds us and we run out of food and water to then it getting really, really serious during the rescue where we could have, like, you know, died in the next few seconds. So many things went wrong. Um, but then a few things had to go right for us to, to be able to make it. So the boat capsized, did you lose all your pers your belongings, like your food and your equipment? Yeah, we lost, uh, we lost pretty much everything. We only had what was on us. What was on you? Well, I mean, whatever we were wearing. Wearing, your clothes, um, yeah. But you didn't have like food clothes. or anything? Like I had, I had my phone, which is the only footage that we've captured from this entire rescue was, was, was in my phone that was in a pocket in my chest, um, in a sort of a waterproof case. Um, all the GoPros, uh, Omar's phone, everything else, you know, lost, lost all the footage that you took, all the footage. We, we had no intention of making a film when we set out. Um, we were just keeping, um, you know, we were just taking content for, for the journey because our goal was to cross the ocean, but also to use this experience to raise awareness about the plight of refugees crossing dangerous seas. And uh, it's crazy that we set out to do that and ended up living those 12, 13 hours between sort of life and death, which, um, which to us, you know, like, you know, you, you have a goal, you have a dream, you have, you know, you set out to do something and then whatever, what you set out to do doesn't happen, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you haven't succeeded or it doesn't necessarily mean mm. that you might not, you may end up with something greater than what you intended. Um, and so we allowed that, to happen to try and swift you know shift our mindset to think that you know do we really want to go back and because everybody expected us to go back and row the ocean again right it's like the classic story you know you fail and then you go back and you do it but would then, you do it again um we wouldn't um and it isn't because we've been traumatized by the ocean like i don't i don't have any don't hold any fear in going out there again and doing it 
because I realized what happened to us was so, so remote um, that it's unlikely that would ever happen again. again. And we would, we would now be more um, resilient, but also more prepared, apt to be able to deal with situations. We feel that we've gotten something much more valuable out of it. I mean, we live an experience that is that is just one of a kind. Uh, to be able to get that close to death and just and still make it, to see, to look at the other side, um, to have gone through that with somebody that you know you we're the only two that know exactly what happened that day. It's also created Bond a for life. huge relationship, brothers, you know, um, and that's amazing. But also, it has given us this amazing platform. Um, to be able to, you know, to address more and raise awareness more about this cause that we intended to row for, but now we have something even more valuable, more valuable. To, to, to talk about. And if anything, it highlights the disparity between our situation and, and refugees because we we decided to do this by choice. We had the best equipment. We got all the right training. They, they have, they no, have nothing. They have no choice. Some, some of them, most of them, come from landlocked countries, and they can't even swim. Uh, that's not even to mention the, the smugglers and the, the, you know, the, the bad people that, that, that take them on board and take advantage. And then after we got saved, it took about two, three weeks, you know, and then our lives came back to normal in a way. Um, but they don't but, have that. They yeah. don't get that. Imagine doing all of this—the level of desperation that you have to go through to do something like this, but just to survive it, to know that your problems are just starting. Um, and I think I think the film coming out now because you know the film was held back because of COVID because it was supposed to be in the cinemas April 2020 and it came out and 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 it was in Vox cinemas in across the across the region and everything. The only um, widely released um, documentary in the region because if as you know like documentaries aren't that popular in the region and they very rarely make See it to the cinemas light of day. and if they do it's just fleeting. You were telling me during the break that, like, if someone to write this movie, people wouldn't believe that that happened. Yeah, because it, it's just like, it's, it's crazy, like, you know, that we, so many things went wrong. Um, you know, it was almost like someone was behind somewhere, like, you know, controlling the situation. It was just, it was so, so dire and bleak at one point. What are some of the lessons that this taught you? I think the most important lesson that we learned was sometimes there is no solution like a solution is not clear or there's no way to find a solution at this exact point in time mm. but the question that you keep have to ask yourself throughout is how can we embedder our situations how can we make our situation just a little bit better it might save our lives or once it and once we make it a tiny little better we keep asking that question again how can we make it just another bit better another bit better and then eventually like a solution presents itself but you know mm. More often than not, you're, you're up against something huge and you can't find a solution and you just give up because it's so like monumental. And there was, a, there was a moment when we were lying on our backs in a sort of a quarter inflated life raft with seven to eight meter waves crashing on us. And we, for a while, we allowed ourselves to just, you know, give up. And I think we were just staring at, this, at the sky just hoping for a miracle or just, you know, we weren't doing anything. And we, we had to kind of like get into this, you know, this mindset of like, okay, what can Survival we do? Survival mode. Yeah. And sometimes it's like, okay, you know, let's, let's, let's clear these, these knots here and focus on this, you know, let's get this sorted. Let's get that sorted, you know? Um, and then just bit by bit by bit, you know, things, um, a solution kind of reveals itself. What did you guys talk about? When we finally got into the raft, when we finally manually inflated the raft, it was about like three hours or so where we were just staring at each other. And uh, we just joked around. Uh, really? We are trying to make light of the situation. Um, that was very different than what was going through our minds. You know, it was, there was some pretty dark thoughts. Um, but we knew that we were both going through something very difficult. And we knew that we have to, the, the self-talk and what we're saying to each other matters. And we just have to keep, you know, we have to keep uh, hopeful. That was the only thing that we had. Speaking of self-talk and like the, the mindset that it requires to climb a mountain or deal with the death of a family member or handle a difficult situation like a pandemic, <laughs> you know, plays a big role on how we can survive something. It's our attitude and how we think about it. Yeah. What do you think is something that like 
you tell yourself when you're facing adversity or difficult situations and especially what you went through with the raging sea and like just like how much of survival depends on your attitude towards what you're telling yourself yeah i mean it's 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 everything right i mean the the ocean thing is a bit of an exceptional story because it was really life and death as in you know it's not like my business is facing you know bankruptcy for example i mean that's not going to kill me but it's it might be really 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 bad mm -hmm. um i think i think ultimately you have to keep yourself focused in understanding that everything is is temporary right so you know and the only thing you can count on is that you know things will change um, and so you just have to be resilient and you just have to, you know, buckle down and, and then just sort of keep at it. Uh, I think whether it's entrepreneurship or life in general, I think, you, you know, it's, you're always, it rewards um, consistency and perseverance. You know, the, what we were saying before about the 99% and the 1%, mm -hmm. so the 1% is about waking up every morning and just focusing on doing your best. You know, some days you'll be ahead, some days you'll be behind. But if you're able to be ahead more days than you're behind, then you're winning. You're winning, right? And I guess understanding also that success is in the pursuit of things and not necessarily like the outcome. I mean, the outcome is obviously important for all of us. But if you just focus on it, then you, you, you miss a lot. And in, and in the case of um, the ocean, the outcome ended up being something completely different than what we set out to. But because we had that flexibility and that versatility, we were able to adjust our perspective and not look at that experience as um, a defeat or failure of sorts. Mm. Um, it actually ended up being like, you know, one of the one of the most valuable um, lessons that we ever learned. Um, and so much, so many opportunities came out of it that we couldn't have dreamt of. Like, how, you know, I would never have dreamt that I would be in Cannes Film Festival as an actor, you know, f with our movie playing. To get there, I had to almost die in the ocean. It's just crazy. It's like, you know, the the famous, you know, Steve Jobs thing of like connecting the dots. You can yeah. only connect them backwards. And, um, you know, if I was any time before, if I, if you told me like, you know, you know these events would have to happen for it was just it's just inconceivable like that was the uh it's just you have to kind of keep slugging i guess one of the reasons i i want to talk to you also today not just about your adventure but about how you support a lot of platforms and causes and you were very active during the me too movement and sexual harassment and all this thing that you're doing now for the work on refugees so what causes are you really leaning into and how are you using your audience, your community to have an impact? And why? Why do you think it's important to do it? I think there's four causes for me that like, I, I spend most of my time working on and they're, they're interrelated, right? Um, so environment, you know, climate change, um, you know, the, the fight against single-use plastic, all sort of in one. Yeah. The, the refugee crisis, they're too interlinked because the environment's going to create in the next few years is going to create the world's biggest um, refugee crisis yep. because of everything that's happening with like you know water levels and climate change and everything else people are going to be fleeing where they are to go to other places yeah and we're just not ready for that as a human race like the way we've dealt with the current refugee crisis has just been horrendous as a planet as a as a species as a humanity yeah. um, and we failed ourselves and we failed the future generation but we're going to be faced with a refugee crisis of immense proportions compared to what we've seen before because of climate. And I'm not seeing enough action, enough things happening to give me confidence that we will be able to mitigate that when it happens. So that's, that's, that's huge. And if, if there's anything I can do to raise awareness about that, that's something that I would love to do. Then okay. there's the Me Too movement. Um, I look at it as a women's issue, but I also look at it as a, just a humanitarian um, human rights issue because it's, it's just wrong that you have, there is something, there, there, is, there is something that is happening that's so wrong that is happening on a daily basis to let's say 50% of the population at every single 
minute of, or every second of every day. That's just it's it's just uh, the the magnitude of of the injustice is, is is huge. About a year and a half ago, when things started sort of to to break out in Egypt and everything like this, uh, there wasn't a premeditated decision from yeah. my side to to I'm going to speak about this. I was so like, you know, I uh, I was so sort of um, angry and and so. You know, it wasn't something that I was finding out about for the first time. We knew that this has you know, been happening, been, been happening, but it, it started to kind of bubble up, bubble up and 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 I, I just was moved into kind of, you know, talking about it. And that's how it started. Um, at the moment, I'm um, I've joined the board of uh, Equality now, which is a tremendous organization based out of um, the U.S. But the women who who started it are from all over the world and it it, it, it works on um basically working on equality um across the world focusing on on maybe 50 or 60 countries they've done work in about 50 or 60 countries but okay. they take the the legal route so a lot of the founders are lawyers lawyers uh, to begin with and they've done an amazing job in fighting and sort of and and turning over legislation and and you know and applying pressure where it matters um advocacy is all, also extremely important and has its place but I feel an organization like that is very impactful because it's it it's then after the advocacy happens and the and the pressure happens, you know, in society, um, you want you, policy change. You need policy change, yeah. and, and they're doing a phenomenal uh, job with that. And then the last thing is extremely close to my heart is um, you know uh, disability. Yeah, um, I had, you know, both my sisters passed away last year uh, due to COVID and the situation on what happened and how it was handled and it's just sort of highlighted um the, you know the how much work there is still to, to do in, in 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 that in that area um so yeah so i i try as much as i can to to support in those areas what's next for you what are you working on now like i i feel that not, I know that you're very into space. I know you're into crypto. You're into NFTs. You're you're heavily engaged online with your brand. You just newly married. What's next for you? What are you focused on next year as we go into a new year? Well, those are all like uh, <laughs> the, the, the marriage is it was a big project. That's uh, that's uh, that's just been recently completed. Um, uh -huh. So yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to the to the next chapter with um, with Mint because you know it's. Um, it, it's it's heartwarming for me to be where I am today because you know looking back over the last few years it was I you know I had a really Difficult. like an uphill uh, battle and there was times when I was convinced that I would never um, be in the spot now which means you know I would never allow myself to to you know to fall in love again or to find love or to to open myself up to uh being hurt let's say because that's 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 what it is at the end of the day um and i had valid reason to think so so I, if i yeah, if i took course. that decision no one would be like oh you know it's it, i'd been hurt in a in a in a in a in a, in a way of sort of an epic proportions so that's so that's something so that's um well, you know one of the things that i've been not so good at before is um you know taking time to be proud of things that i've done, done. Um, and to you know take stock of them rather than just sort of move from one to thing the to the next thing, thing and, and just be chasing something so that's that's the, that's the one thing um, um, I think I'd like to be able to um, to work smart um, I think in the last like couple of decades it's just been so much about the grind um, and there's definitely a lot that you can accomplish through grit um, but there's also something to be said for, you know, being able to find the right balance. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, the COVID sort of crisis and everything that happened, um, you know, gave me some time to to reflect and think, how do I want to live my life really? Because I, I, I want to create value and I want to apply myself. But at the same time, I don't want to do that at the expense of family. I don't want to do that at the expense of fi daughter, finding joy yeah. as well, yeah. because that's... But that's something that's really important. Um, and I think some of these things that you just mentioned, you know, whether it's NFTs or crypto and all these things, they are actually, you know, they're powerful tools that could potentially allow you to unlock this this formula, right? Because I, I think we're we're lucky to be born 
I mean, you always used to look at my parents' generation or the generation before that and say, ah, you know, they were really lucky because my parents' generation are the ones that sort of acquired the, uh, the you know, the distribution rights for whether it's automotive or this or that. Yeah, and that's yeah. a lot and of the early value days. creation was yeah, done that the way. the early days. Or the, or the grandparents are the ones that acquired the land, you know, yeah. which then skyrocketed over time. And, and then we feel that we had a, living a time of like saturation and just kind of, and this is a this is a this is an amazing opportunity of us being living in a the time beginning when it's actually the beginning. Yeah, the beginning. Um, and there's a lot to to learn and to understand, and there's a lot of unknowns and stuff. But I've I've made a life of being comfortable with the unknown, and so it doesn't really. So I'm th that's exciting for me. Mm -hmm. um, which side of it will I w w you know do I want to be? Like at the moment, I'm just sort of in it i'm not involved as in like i don't have a business that is that is in that field and you yeah. know like but i'm but i'm definitely invested and um well you have ip so your film is intellectual property yeah your brand is your ip nfts are about you know digital asset of your ip yeah so yeah, I guess need to like. We need to sit and talk about it. <laughs> I'm we ready. need to sit and talk about it. We build an NFT strategy I'm for just your reading, brand. Like, I, you know, I, I, you have to just be a good listener. Like a lot of people are like, "Oh, Maha, we want to get into NFTs. What do we got to do?" I'm like, "You got to study. You have to read. You have to like. It's like it's like the early days when the internet was started, and all those yeah, guys yeah. in the garages were like sitting around their computers figuring it out and like creating it. And it's now everything's gonna be done through blockchain." Yeah. You come from finance. This is like going back to your roots, but like in a new way to kind of propel people forward. And I think, I think a lot of people just need to take time to study things. It's not quick money. It's not quick wins. It's yeah. really like got to lean in. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about that. When or where is your next uh, hike? The next hike is uh, New Year's. Okay. I'm I'm off to Nepal for like a week, which like is is I'm so happy with that because. This will be my 22nd visit to Nepal. 22nd? It's really like my second home. And it had been sort of closed for, you know, due to COVID for so long. So it's so exciting to be going back. Okay. And meeting all my friends there and everything. But also taking a whole bunch of people. I know, I really want to go. Some of them like our friends. I and know. And like showing them, showing them like, you know, why this place is so special. And what about next year? Next year, um, well, what I'm trying to do is like, other than all, you know, the work stuff and everything, um, yep. I'm trying to um, have like, you know, three, four adventures that I do um, every year. Where Outside I, where I, where of I your people on. wild Gwanab? With wild okay. Gwanabna, but, you know, that where I lead and, okay. and, do, and do that. So the one that I know of that I'm very excited about is in, it's going to probably be in July where I'm going to go back to Peru. That's another place that I, that I really love. Um, and then just Machu you know, Picchu or somewhere else like uh, Machu Picchu is in the south. Okay. Um, so we have a bunch of uh, trips going there as well. But the one I'm referring to will be going to the north, which is, which is less trodden sort of part of Peru and really wild, um, where there's some of the most beautiful sort of um, hiking um, and climbing if you want, like uh, there. It's considered like the mecca, the climbing mecca of of, um, of the Americas. One of the most beautiful things about COVID was how it helped the environment. Like people weren't polluting it as much and, and, and getting back to like basics of like spending time with each other and like yeah. talking to each other and families were forced to stay home with each other and get to know each other and build relationships. Do you think people will go back to that? Talking from, a, from an ecotourism perspective, like that just came to a halt, right? Um, but it actually pushed people's um desire to connect with nature and to um try to live experiences rather than sort of just focus on just acquiring material things and and to prioritize mental health and to prioritize their own well-being and so on which is you know is and, it's important yeah so 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 i feel we've done we've accomplished um you know in the last year in that area more than we would have in you know if if if, if covid hadn't happened so that's uh I, I also think it changed like the future of travel like i think people are intentional about their travels now like they want to go experience certain things they didn't get to travel so now they really want to travel yeah absolutely and they think a lot about 
how they spend their time. So like, because we can work from anywhere, yeah. why don't I go work from Brazil? Why don't I go see the world and work from other locations? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's had a profound impact on travel and how people think about where they work and where they live. Yeah. And hopefully it's had a profound impact also on, you know, how people approach travel, right? Because so much of travel is actually damaging to the environment, right? Um, if you if you are going to go and decide to travel, you have to realize that you are going to have a footprint, even if you're traveling eco, right? So there has to be, a, but, but when you're traveling, you're also helping the communities, the host communities around. Mm -hmm. So you're creating, you're creating economies and you're creating work opportunities as well, and you're empowering people. So it's, it's, it's a double thing. So it's good to be aware. Um, and I think a lot of the mass um, sort of tourism, you know, that is, that is um, of yesteryear kind of is being pushed away faster. Uh, making way for you know more sustainable forms of tourism which is which has to be the case right yeah um, when you were saying about covid helping the environment it was a double-edged thing right because yes um, it did in some respects but when it came to wildlife in some areas of the world we actually went backwards why because um, so much of poaching was allowed to happen because there weren't any as policing. much security and policing that poachers were running wild and doing you know two or three times more than they were doing in before so it was depending on where Double you are in the world sword. what's happening um but uh but yeah favorite place to travel nepal <laughs> himalayas mountains where you've never been that you'd love to go oh man uh definitely um i'd love to go back to south america visit some of the places that i that I didn't go like colombia for example i'd love to visit some of these like crazy small islands in the middle of the ocean like micronesia really and Never just like heard of it. just like what are people like you know just people like like a dot in the middle of an ocean like what are these people how do these people live what are they doing with their lives like that would be interesting for me rowing or skiing neither <laughs> neither <laughs> uh hiking obviously is your preferred i mean I, i'm not a good skier okay but i i enjoy it and uh if i had if I, I'd always just pick to be like, you know, on my Do you bike? Feet. Uh, like, uh, like bicycle or biking? More, yeah. Yeah. Just like recreational. Recreational, know. not like yeah, long yeah. distance biking or all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. What's your mission for 2022? Uh, my mission for 2022 is to find that, you know, that right balance between, between work and, you know, finding joy while being able to, to create value where it matters and to really stay on on the hopefully on the you know the cutting edge of everything that's changing so fast you know whether it's the metaverse or crypto or, or this and that just because i find it so fascinating yeah um seems. and because i'd like i want to be part of the discourse that is happening um but obviously also because there's you know there's so much value to be made as well and you know that's that is our generation's opportunity so i, I I don't want to be left behind. Amr Samra, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, man, as uh, We follow you, Amr Samra, on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, Wild Guanabra, is that uh, website.com? Yes. What else? Anything else that you should follow? I'm going to put it in the Yeah, I mean, it's, well. it's, it's Amr Samra on everything, except uh, Facebook page is Amr's page. And then it's Wild Guanabra on everything as well. I'm going to go on a hike with you. It's actually my goal for 2022. Cool. I'm we'll gonna get it. on a. I'm gonna get on a mountain with you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.